Okay, everybody, hey, let's get started. So welcome to the Silicon Valley Deep Learning Group. For many of you, welcome back. Uh, this is uh, almost uh, three years we've been doing the Silicon Valley Deep Learning Group. I don't have the exact number for this particular event, but it seems to be well over 30. There's now over 5,000 members of the Silicon Valley Deep Learning Groups. I'm told it's 5,020. So of course, many of our members are people who come to the events and, uh, and, and fill up these venues that we have. Uh, there were more than 100 people waitlisted for this event, so some people definitely made the wrong choice. They should have come and grabbed the three or four extra seats that are here. But uh, I'm glad you all could make it tonight. And uh, you know, for our viewers at home, of course, all these talks are recorded, and we play them. Uh, we put them on YouTube for people to access there, and that makes up many of our many of our group members are actually people uh, throughout the country and throughout the world who tune in to our to our great talks. Speaking of great talks, let me introduce Dr. Gary Bradsky. So Dr. Bradsky and I have known each other for quite some time. We worked together back at Intel in the early days when he was busily creating OpenCV. Uh, OpenCV, for those of you who don't know, is the open source computer vision library that dominates pretty much all computer vision done these days. Uh, before deep learning came along, OpenCV was the backbone of pretty much all uh, computer vision, and now in the more modern era, as people are doing a great deal of deep learning, OpenCV kind of fits in with that and is part of the image processing pipelines that pretty much everyone uses in their uh, vision-oriented deep learning activities. So uh, Dr. Bradsky was at Intel at that time. Since then, he has been at any number of places, Stanford University, Willow Garage, um, something that was sold to Microsoft that I forgot what it was called, uh, <laughs> Video Surf. And, uh, and, and more recently, Magic Leap, and then after leaving Magic Leap, uh, Gary Bradsky joined uh, Array.ai, or I guess it's now Array.com. It's Array, okay? <laughs> A, it's, okay, A-R-R-A-I-Y, so that's with AI. And uh, I'm going to let Gary tell you what they're doing at Array.ai, but Array.ai, as you can see from the title here, is, is applying deep learning to problems in the film industry. Gary's going to talk about that. He's going to talk about what they're doing at Array.ai Array AI, or Array AI. He's going to talk about some of the recent things that they've released into the public that show work that they've been doing at the company. And I guess he's also going to follow up with a few comments about OpenCV itself. So if you all could give Dr. Bradsky a big hand and welcome him to the Deep Learning Group. Thanks, Adrian. OK, um, deep learning in the film industry and a few comments about uh, the, where OpenCV is going. I'm actually going to start with that since it just worked out better. <laughs> okay, so um, I still run, I, I wear a lot of hats, too many, uh, and uh, I still run OpenCV. And it's, uh, well, it's a diffuse effort. Uh, Intel is supporting it again right now, and so we have a team there. But I'm trying to uh, like secure its long-term future. I I want to I want it to outlive me without me dying quickly. So <laughs> and, and so I was talking with Gladlin Colton, um, who had released this Open 3D, and I go, well, why not collect all these like vision components? Open 3D is a really well-crafted 3D library. It's meant for for RGBD or just D data, but but predicated on dense data. And it, it, it's really parsimonious and really well crafted. And so I was talking with him. He was at Stanford, but now he's running Intel research something. I, I asked him why he went there, and uh, they gave him sort of the best deal in free hand. So um, we're going to combine these into in this summer. I've already got a legal firm working on this into a. Uh, into uh, Open Source Vision Foundation. So opencv.org is going to be housed there with Open3D. The libraries will be kept distinct, but they'll, be, they'll interoperate well. And there's also uh, a kind of curated VNN to run uh, optimized deep nets fast that will probably be like solution oriented, like this one nails basis, so it's there. And, and, and uh, you know, because we're not going to compete with with the many, many uh, uh, deep source, uh, deep open, deep learning libraries around, but but I think a curated list of things that are like vetted to do well at certain jobs will be there, and 
<laughs> so this is kind of like um, the the current plans as this gets going. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be um, I, I'm currently running it, and you know corporations only have three top level roles, actual ones. There's president, treasurer, and secretary, and that's it. The rest are made up. But but basically, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue on as president. Um, Ladlin is he's gonna advise. He, he's like. I, I regard him as one of the top guys in computer vision right now, deep and not. Uh, you can just look at his work. Uh, uh, Vincent Rabat has been involved uh, for a long time, and Achen Bomek is, is, uh, was like in line to be um, Intel CEO, but now he's with Starkey. He's the CTO there. They're the top maker of hearing aids. But he has a lot of open source experience, too. And then. We have the pool masters, which are Vadim Kuzarevsky has been with OpenCV forever, and then and then this um, Shin Shinyi Zhao. I, I might be uh, mispronouncing Chinese, but uh, he he's the pool master for Open3D. So they're going to all continue on and maintain the library, and then we're going to try to you know flood in some funding and actually like get this on a good basis and. There's a bunch of other people, and I'm sure I'll drag in Adrian in some form. But uh, you know, these are these are the lists, and we have, so we have people in China, Italy, and France. That's that's um, Vincent and Spain. So the, there's a uh, worldwide that Vadim's in Russia. So um, there's a lot of worldwide activity in this. Okay, so start out with the ass. I, I, I'm going to be looking for a CEO that's going to run this thing because I just can't run it while I'm running my other things. And, uh, and of course, I'm trying to get enough funding where um, we'll be able to pay developers and, and a strong organizer admin to start you know, doing a workshop and developing courseware and things like that. Uh, that'll be involved with the foundation. But, okay, so that's the Open Source Vision Foundation, which is, uh, they'll, they'll still be the distinct opencv.org and open3d.org, but they'll be indexed uh, through this. Uh, okay, on to Array, uh, which is a company um, I started, uh, well, in a weird way, I literally in a Silicon Valley garage, drinking whiskey at 2 a.m., and I was with the, um, Ethan Rubley, uh, who was a guy I co-founded Industrial Perception with, and and we were both disgruntled with our various jobs. Uh, if you look at the history of uh, Bransky, Adrian, Leap, and you'll you'll get you'll get a mouthful. But um, so uh, in, in either case, um, as we were talking, he was showing me things he was working on in light field imaging, and and then he was typing away uh, and. Uh, he said, I just sent in my letter of resignation. So I go, I, I, I actually made him show me his, he was a co-founder with Industrial Perception, but he has two young kids. So I made him show me his bank account to make sure I'm not <laughs> causing little kids to starve. And then I go, okay, I, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm funding it. Because at the time, uh, you know, I had different plans, but I, but I ended up joining it. And, um, uh, about uh, almost exactly, well, a little more than a year ago. So, so I'm now there as CTO. And uh, what is Array? Like this is the vision. We give superpower to superpowers to visual storytellers. That's the that's the line. Um, automating visual content creation. So this is all in the film industry, and I'm going to go through what we're doing and and what are the things. So this. This is something that I first started with a few things that are publicly released that I can show. So this is uh, Black Eyed Peas for Will I Am. And so this was released, and and we did the spatialization of the faces. So you see, these are civil rights era stock photos, and there's dust on them. So like they're they've gone they're already getting covered with dust, but there's still this injustice. This is basically what the rap song is about. And so these are the current singers and they're just blended into these stock civil rights photos. So I don't you know 
I had to listen to this song so many times when it was being made. <laughs> I, you know, it got me into rap. But <laughs> uh, I, I really, I do like the art. Like the guy is kind of a genius because uh, I, I mean, just using that that concept of uh, these decaying photos. And you see, the photos have been spatialized. That wasn't by us, but we're we we did the faces, so it made it very easy for them to match them up. And we'll get on to that. Here's another thing we did uh, a little earlier. This was with the mill and Unreal. But it, what we did is very precise tracking of, of this car. Now, cars, if you know, like everything has gotten more efficient production. So often when they need to take a commercial, there's only like one or two prototypes and they can't afford to give them. And also the car companies don't want anyone knowing what their car is going to look like. So here it's just an electric dune buggy that can actually resize its wheelbase and match the torque of anything you program in. And so this is actually, you know, that car and it's being overlaid. What's interesting is this is being done in real time. So we had to do very accurate tracking here in real time, like no jitter at all and under robust situations. It was unveiled in GDC of, of uh, more than a year ago. We were part of the keynote speech. And at the end, they, they, they had curtains around this car and it dropped and they were filming it and, and all the press rushed up with their flash cameras and we were going, ah, we never tested in that. And, and, but it, we had done it in so many different lighting conditions that it was flash didn't bother it. So you can see they can change this model, the color, the type of car on the fly. The reflections are accurate in it because it's got a 360 panel that's then being stitched onto the actual model and like a beefy machine that's running Unreal and just doing this in real time. Um, it, it kind of opened our eyes to say that that's where content is going. It's, it's all going, it's kind of a raised vision where the cameras are going to go. They aren't going to be taking imagery someday, let's say 10 years they, they won't take imagery anymore, they'll just take parameters and then we'll just recreate the scene and then you can distribute it anywhere. Um, so this thing, that what we worked on, one, the, 2017 the SIGGRAPH uh, Best Real-Time Graphics and Interactivity Award. Um, so, you know, we continue to work with them on other things, but uh, we're heads down in products right now. So this is another, um, basically showing some of the making of, uh, I think, you know, a lot of this is redundant, it was shown, but this is actually a car. A lot of those markers were put there because everything in Hollywood is done by hand. And so they have human marker, often triangular things. And then we just slapped on April tags. And then I don't know if you saw that, that it's called the Russian arm, that truck that's going around it. Um, we create a model on the fly, so we make a 3D model, and then we try to match very accurately to it. But so here is like the making of, and uh, that's Will I Am, uh, you know, the lead singer, and has Malcolm X, and on and on. Um, it's, it's some of the Black IP members turning them, blending them into the photo. Both guys are him, you know. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is starting to get into special effects, and, and we're providing the assets for that. We're working with, with uh, the Black IPs have hired, uh, you know, these movie makers, and so we're just working with them. Uh, he's very sort of tech friendly, so he's easy to work with. So again, uh, special effects, uh, you know, uh, what are they as a restatement? And I'm going to show a film and waste some of your time because this is the best film that I've seen showing it. And I hope it's so. So VFX. In today's films, it is possible to create almost anything. But the work is definitely not that easy. It includes many hours of attention to small detail Lots of creativity this is not us. and a it's, high uh, level of skill. Borrow this YouTube because this it world it well. is called Three VFX minutes, so I get to and is built from many parts right. in a long pipeline that creates something amazing. And that's what you see on the big screen. The last role in this long pipeline of visual effects is called digital compositing, which is a creative process of assembling filmed and rendered elements from multiple sources to create a final lifelike illusion. What is that, you ask? 
Let me show you. It's a profession that includes many skills, such as rotoscoping, which separates the foreground from the background, talking more and about there are this. all kinds of techniques to accomplish it. In films, it is common to use a blue or green screen to easily remove the background from behind the actors, and that is called keying. And by doing that, we can create a more realistic background behind the actor. Tracking is another side of the story, and it is very important to know how to do well. There's 2D tracking, and there's 3D tracking, which recreates the exact movement of the camera. Another big part of this job is to remove objects, cables, and trackers, and paint them out and insert something else instead. And, of course, there is computer-generated elements, or, in short, CG compositing. But well, my friends always say VFX looks fake. So obviously there is this full of special effects that he wasn't coming out. And almost every movie you see is full of special effects. Uh, Social Network had some of the most special, largest amount of special effects ever. That you don't see it. They were duplicating faces on the twins. One actor was just overlaid on the other. Okay, so that that's the, the the good intro to what's going on. So there are many parts of VFX, and what we're doing as Array is we're providing the assets that go in. We have aspirations that will go on and get into compositing and the other parts. But the first thing we're doing is rotoscoping, which I'll go into detail, and that is the masking of things, uh, creating mats, and like right below, these are alpha mats, are how you blend things together. Uh, they're made, in, as he said, in many ways. Um, there's the tracking of the camera and, and the, the 3D, basically scenic elements. Mocap is like moving things, the, the people, and, and there's many more. There's, there's lighting and, and dimensionalization, spatialization of the, the scene, doing 3D. And again, what's unusual, there's two things that are sort of specific to us within deep learning and, and vision. And one is, we're doing this at cinemagraphic quality. So one way of doing it is you get your little segmentation on the phone and hope you're going to get up to the film industry. We think it's more likely that we're going to do things perfectly and then drive it down and, and get up to your phone. Um, let's see, I said two things. Uh, <laughs> and now I've just forgotten the second, so I, I can't run for office. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, yeah. The, 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 for what we're doing, usually there's a ground truth, right? And we, of course, try to synthesize that ground truth. But for us, it's, it's what really, it, humans are the consumers of this, and it's, and it's artists that are actually the consumers of what we're doing. And for them, there is no set truth. Like, I saw all the details of how the film Gravity was made, and all the 3D is wrong in that film, because they stretched it for dramatic effect. And, and they showed me back and forth, and they really did a good job of making, like, hills and stuff look scary and, and the 3D, you know, pop out, whereas when you have it actually accurate, it was kind of bland. So they're, they're, everything's done for dramatic effect. So th there's a lot of stuff going on, but th this is sort of a basic intro of, of visual effects. And now I'm going to go on. We're going to do rotoscoping. So what is rotoscoping? It was invented in 1915. It's literally tracing a little the early Disney films and early films and tracing over Tracing over objects, and here it's projected on a on a light board, and they're actually making physical mats now. This is, of course, done digitally, um, but it is a very slow process, and it's almost all done by hand. So, in a in a decent film, Game of Thrones, it takes about 30 minutes per frame, uh, and so it's very expensive. And what they do to get these things moving through is they have thousands of people, and if somewhere in India, someone is taking the left ear of someone, or the right hair is over here, and someone's taking the middle hairs, and on and on. I'll show some of these things as we go on. So this is a very tedious process. And the growth in special effects is huge. Netflix is, is going to do a 1,000 films next year. That includes like the 
parts of the serials they're doing. But they, they want, the problem is you can binge watch and run out of content in your niche. Long ago, there used to, well, now still, there, there are these things called blockbusters. And they're, you know, that a film that hits everybody and makes a billion bucks. And blockbusters are kind of like Big Macs. They're, they sort of suit the average taste. They're kind of bland, but they're full of, like, you know, all kinds of sugar and salt and fat so that it, it's kind of addictive. And that's what a blockbuster is. Now, more people like Blade Runner was a failure at like a quarter billion dollars because it costs too much to make. But, and, and they said, oh, that hit a niche audience. It's still a pretty big niche audience. If you could have made that for a tenth of the cost, it would be like minting money. And so Netflix is attempting to do this because they want to make so much content in your niche that you can't run out. You simply can't keep up with it. And that keeps you on the site. And, and all the others, Prime Video and Hulu and, and all the studios are trying to do the same. So the problem is they cannot scale the rotoscoping fast enough. We could, you, you just can't hire 10x the number of people, keep them trained and working. And, and so there is this need for this at, at this time. And, and um, we're going to go into the tedium of rotoscoping. And the problem is that thing is in my way. Uh, Jesus. Didn't think of this. Uh, I, I, I didn't want to uh, go this advance towards the end. So th this is like, if you can see, there's little red marks everywhere. Those are splines. And they chunk up the body into splines. And there's splines in the middle of the body. They're just covering parts. And, and then this is, of course, moving, so there is basic tracking, but it's not totally accurate, and it's planar tracking, whereas the real objects are in 3D, so you get, you get um, perspective effects that, but, but this is what's done. These people march these things along, and there's tricks. They spend a lot of time looking back and forth to the frames to they get a feel for what you can do and where you can interpolate and to move these things faster, um, but it, it it is quite tedious. I don't know that this song. Um, no, maybe they're. Uh, so, you know, and, and this is a program, one of the tools they use, Silhouette. So there he's turning on the mats to try to check it against the background. And for some reason, this keeps dying. <laughs> ah, now I ended up switching the page. So, trying to switch back. Well, Okay, so rotoscoping is tedious. I'm just going to move on. Uh, here's what uh, rotoscopers get when they look. How do they tell people? So the artist, or director, um, filmmaker is going to say, I want this rotoscope because we're going to blend it with the scene. And, and this is how they give directions. Like, do that, do that, get this piece of clothing, that car, whatever they need to do in the scene. And a lot of times, you can see it's not just people, right? It's all kinds of stuff. But people are, are a big category. I'd say it's about 45%, not even 50%. But um, there's all kinds of stuff. Bushes, I've seen foam on the water. So this has to be a pretty general technique we're going to do. People, solving people is not solving the problem. Not, not even half the problem, right? So, and, and these things have to be done at sub-pixel accuracy. So, so that's what is happening. Now, we have data sets from industry, 10 years of them. And they weren't created as uh, learning data sets. So there's all kinds of weird things, like what do you do with the splines in the middle of the body? They're meaningless. They're just a patch to cover things. All the time, they're saving money. So they'll, they'll cut off half the body. They just don't need to do the rest. And, and you have to somehow like, figure out how to put this in your training data set. Uh, often, like there'll be like a dog walking and a car passes in front, but they keep the splines there. So when you get the data set out, the side of the car is labeled as a dog, and and so there's a lot of uh, data cleaning that has to go up. And, and so as all four deep netters, like the story is data. <laughs> so a lot of road, well, some road of scoping is easy. Like you have rigid objects, a car is pretty easy. There are things that'll track it. The hard things, for example, is hair. And I don't, if you can see all the little red lines, they will actually track each hair. And some programs actually have some sort of kinematics with that, but it's getting a little uh, bit wild. 
So, and, 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 and in this, you can sort of see the rotoscope image. And again, they're using this to differentially enhance the image. Like, she might have just been dancing anywhere. They put the pyramids behind her. Um, or they're going to blend, or they're going to treat the lighting differently, or they're going to bring out some contrast. And, and so, and you can see all this, the rotoscoping work with the splines. So they obviously charge more for the hard than the easy. And um, this is just one of the things you get in rotoscoping. You get a lot of animation. A lot of animation is actually a result of rotoscoping. I don't know if you've seen the film This Waking Life, but that's all a rotoscope film. And it makes things kind of look jangly, because that's the frame that's being done a little sloppily. And kind of cool effect. Uh, you know, so this is just someone um, who's showing, uh, you know, uh, turning himself into a cartoon character, uh, which is a lot of fun. Again, uh, just to reiterate, here, here's uh, Iron Man. It, this involved 1,800 people to rotoscope Iron Man. So in teams, they're doing all this stuff, and this is showing some of the effects. He was in a, held by wires in a green screen. And they're taking all kinds of views, and they're creating a new room, so they've dimensionalized the space, and they're tracking the camera in the space, and then reprojecting the model in, in there, and you know, on and on. So um, some of these jobs are rather, uh, you know, not just humans again. They're a spatialization of the scene and the lighting and everything. Um, so what we're doing is uh, trying to teach a machine how to do this. And um, how do you do that? Well, if anyone knows, tell me, because I'm kind of under a deadline. <laughs> under a deadline here. So, you know, like, <laughs> Before the money runs out, you got to figure it out. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, camera. Well, so what we're we're trying to insert in, like, automate this production process, um, become part of the pipeline, so that we can uh, kind of help ourselves uh, boost this thing up. And and many people have like many ships have uh, you know crashed upon the shore. Um, what uh, for, for one, there was uh, Lytro. Uh, we're taking a very different approach in that we're trying, we, we've talked and we've hired, we've got two uh, producers working full time on our staff, uh, I mean directors, and some of them have big credits. They did, I don't know, all kinds of films that I didn't know, but I can't remember right now. But, uh, uh, and what we're trying to do is be very non-intrusive. So, we can work, and we are working in some things, on with just what they call the hero camera, the, the central camera. Here we're using three of the same type, but the center one could be replaced by any multi-hundred-k camera or whatever you want, the red camera or Canon or whatever you want, the high-end visual cam uh, the movie cameras. The others are a, a mid-level a mid uh, movie camera that does 4K video. So we're trying to use high-quality video here. but. But we work with no cameras, like just what they have. But we like to add a few cameras because uh, 3D helps uh, for a number of things. One of which is spatializing the scene, but potentially with segmenting it, and, and a few other things. And then, so what we make really these are all stock camera. We make some simple synchronization circuitry. Again, that that was many months for a very simple job. You have to worry about the rise time, the idiosyncrasy. The idiosyncrasies of, of um, each camera, like when they actually respond to a trigger, they're all different. And so we have to make this adjustable pulse that will align them all. And, and so there's a lot of work, but we're trying to make this rock solid. Again, when you're on a well, when you're on a film set, it's a little bit like an expensive scientific experiment. They have contracts. They bring in all these people and expensive actor time. And they might, you know, close off the street, and they got security. And that guy has one shot. The, the director, guy or gal, has one shot at getting the data, which is the film that he's going to work with. Really <coughs> impossible, well, almost impossible to impossible to recreate that condition that they're trying to capture. And so they don't tolerate fools, and they don't tolerate bad machinery. So we put months and months, and they turn this thing on. It gets the data, it doesn't drop a single frame, on and on and on. They just 
they'll kick you right off in the middle of a film, and that's sort of the end of you. And that's happened to some of our competitors. They just kick them right off the set, right in the middle of filming. He goes, too much hassle. You're in my way. So we're trying to stay out of the way. This pack, as you see it, rotating, can run entirely by batteries. We're working with some manufacturers going to shrink this kind of thing down. Uh, but we're, we're not hoping to make hardware. We just want to put specs out that people can meet. And um, we deal with the calibration of these things, the color balancing of the cameras, the geometry between them, the intrinsics in them, the focus. So the hero camera is always changing focus. They write this down by hand, and it's the poor guys post-production have to deal with it. Well, we can obviously use calibration online and give them the focus. Um, the color balance, as I said, and, Synchronization. So here's some of the calibration patterns we use, and we use other little tricks to make sure everything is still in sync. So there's gray balancing, color balancing, uh, geometric in here, and, and a few other things. I, like I said, we work with multi-camera arrays. We we built up 50 camera things. Uh, it, like it kind of like uh, in work for some potential future of uh, AR VR, but uh, we put this on hold uh, because, you know, we think it's going to take a lot longer for AR and VR to really get here. Uh, and also, it's not clear that the bang for the buck is there. But it, it did give our software the nice boost of, like, if you want extra cameras, it, it all works, right? So data collection, this is, like, the core of uh, anyone doing deep nets. How do you get the data that's doing what you want? And it's hard. Um, so one of the things we want to do is those hard rotoscoping jobs, and, and this is how we're gathering the data for that. Uh, we're, we're, um, we're putting a lot of hard objects in front of uh, our data capture and, and running systems of equations that allow us to extract the exact ground truth. And, and then we're compositing or blending or actually putting physical environments behind uh, to get a, now we know the ground truth and this is the background. So I'm gonna show some examples of that. So, you know, here is one of those hard things. The hair is going all over the place and, and there's the ground truth that we extract. And, and this just goes on, bike helmet. Uh, you, you can see like there are little like fine edge lines and, and uh, you know, things that happen. Some edges are a little fuzzier and, and people worry about this in films. Again, like crazy hair, this is like be almost impossible for a human to rotoscope, but we can get the exact ground truth. And on and on. Um, so here is the first uh, experiments that we're, we've run and we started training on this. And uh, you know, like we're getting to the point where it's hard to tell what's the real and, and what's the ground truth. The ground truth is, is diagonal right, and on well, your left is the prediction. It, you know, you can see some flaws in it, but it, it's doing pretty well. And there's the composite using the prediction. Uh, and so here's the, you know, the prediction of hair. Um, you know, so this is using a kind of green screen. By the way, green screening itself is not solved. It's, it's very labor intensive because there's all this crap in real green screens. And, and there's color. Uh, they felt color splash. Or, um, basically, the green gets mixed in with everything. And they have, you know, they, they put a lot of work in getting it out. Not every, the lighting can be unbalanced. You can have wrinkled green screens. So it's a big pain. And it often doesn't work very well and takes a lot of touch-up work. So we're just trying to, we're, we need it for data collection, but it is itself a useful product. And, and so, you know, here we are again with some hard examples. These are like feathers, they're very hard, and you know, we're doing fairly well there in predicting. And this is just the preliminary results and uh, um, somewhat probably overfit to the data. But sometimes it's okay to do overfitting when you have to do a specific situation. So that's one of the things we might uh, employ. And the green screen, so we're gathering a lot of this data, uh, you know, real movement, green screen. So we had a party, we had a, we gathered about 100 people there, and we've been continuing to gather more. Um, just people doing real stuff in front of the cameras. We have different lighting conditions that we can 
control in this stage. And, um, and here you're seeing the control uh, software. So this is another thing that's also part of what we're doing. We're going to have a camera spec that you can build to or buy from us. And there's a cart that has a bunch of GPUs that are going to chew this up and control everything. And also, I'll show you a little bit, we intend to give a real-time feedback on set. Again, it's a scientific experiment. They got one shot. You want to know that the dragon's going to look right when you're done. And so we'll be able to show the dragon or the medieval castle or whatever it is. Um, so the ground truth is going to be done. We have, we have like a pretty uh, storied Hollywood director working for us. And he's doing a lot of his grunt work. That's why he, of our company is a good balance of young and old. He's a good deal older than me, and I'm not young. <laughs> um, but he's he's a grizzled veteran, and he just want, you know gets his hands dirty with the tools. So we like that. Um, okay, deep nets. So we're trying a lot of deep nets, and I, I don't know who's run a company. Like the most important thing you do when you do deep nets is you. You should just spend all your time building the pipeline so that you know if you're making progress or not. Because uh, we've had lots of experiments, and you go, what did you, I see you got that segmenting, but what did you do that's different? And, and so you know, a lot of our efforts starting to go into just building this engineering infrastructure of just tracking where the data is, being able to pull it up, what was the performance, what are some validation examples, how is it doing visually? And this is just, you know, a network we played with. We're playing with many. Um, this is like some uh, some results that are in the wild um, of a network. It, again, it's not it, it's not at all converged. It has a lot of errors in it. But uh, we're doing this by stage. We want to do the green screen first, and then this is sort of as a side benefit. We're testing it in front of uh, crazy stuff and seeing how. Now, we're using multiple inputs. So this is like an example of an extension of that network. So we have left, right, and center cameras. And that's the input here. And, and you know, many ideas on how to use geometry within, explicitly or implicitly within a network. This is just some training, like through the training, watching it. scenes, I think. But this is just preliminary stuff. And, and, and probably not even our first product. Um, but one of the things we have is we're doing human in the loop. Well, here's the, the first. Before the, uh, I'm just showing, like, there is a card where the director will get ground truth. And this was, this was older work, so it, it's flakier. Uh, but it just shows this idea of, of, you know, he's already in the scene. All the director needs is good enough. Like, it doesn't have to be production quality here. They just have to see that what they're doing is going to look right if the dragon's going to be in the scene right. And, and so this gives them that real-time feedback. So we're using human in the loop, which, uh, you know, lots of secret sauce of how to actually make this effective. But you know, here are some results on real films uh, of uh, you know running networks, and you can see like some of them are being segmented or asked like what they want to get out of it, and and so we're we're looking at a, several ways of doing this, um, working working with existing artists is a little tough because it's like being in the the buggy and whip days and you got an automobile and they're saying like where's the whip and how, how fast do you whip to you know get this thing going. It's hard to get these people who are trained in doing these tedious tools to say, well you don't have to do that. You can think of it differently. And I don't want it. So so we're hiring our own artists to, to do this because it's a little too much to tell someone in Bangalore through another firm like, oh can you try it this way? So other work in BFS staff sets. This you've seen before in that intro video, but we do it too. So we're very good at 
you know, precise tracking of where the camera is, and now we're using natural features to do this. But if you want to throw up these tracking things, it works, and it works on clothing. And so this was work for a, a test of uh, creating a computer game that someone's working on. They want like a Lego-like character, and that's the proxy for it. And, and you'll notice like his collar's not showing up, so it's called the clean plate. We know what the background is and can replace it. I don't know if that was evidence. Hmm, I should have thought of that. Uh, but you see his collar is sticking up there, and now it's removed. There's a clean plate behind. That was that uh, swipe of, uh, I don't know if I can go back far enough to when it was, uh, I'll give up. <laughs> Anyhow, it, you saw like he was made invisible or not. That's the, we, we always know where we are geometrically. And we took this, we can generate the background because we have cameras left, right, and center. And we're just stitching the background in. Okay, so we're doing other stuff, and uh, you know, this this was real dancers were hiring <laughs> to again to test um, what we can do and and to test body segmentation. It's not the most active short-term thing we're doing, but it's part of these programs. Okay, so that's basically uh, what we're doing, and here's the blurb about. Um, in the market and experience, um, um, talk to us. We had a, we just raised a, a ten million dollar A round, and we hit, there is there's a New York Times article uh, describing the company, and and there we are looking somber, and that's why I decided I went out and bought new shirts and pants after I saw myself. <laughs> but. Um, they told us they don't want anyone smiling, so we all look like we're... <laughs> uh, anyhow, um, this is just fun stuff. Like, we're doing, we're going all the way through to film. So we're, we, this guy, in fact, is a contract. He's a director. He does all kinds of documentaries you might have seen. But he's working with us, and he, he, he made, like, five films that that go from easy to hard and contain elements like horizontal like thin things are just bad in film. And so we're going to make a film about a, a self-driving car and this car is going to be replaced with a DeLorean or something and you know but this is like the rotoscoping this is a decently hard rotoscoping job and the the thing will look like more like a lab in the back and and uh, you know, so he's giving us like, okay, you're going to want to rotoscope the car, and we'll make a, a film with this. Again, this is the kind of instructions. So this is like eating our own dog food, and, and we've taken a whole bunch of films. Like I said, this is a professional actor we hired, and we're doing this kind of stuff all the time. So if you want to have fun with us, it can be fun. Um, I don't know how I am for time. Um, Thirty-six minutes. Thirty-six. So you'll get out early. This is some of the calibration with our Iranian friend. Uh, this thing's going on a track. Um, this was uh, this act in Vegas. So they went down there, rolled out a green screen, and you know, some of these things we're going to create all the assets for, it, like this one, make a film out of it, but then tell, tell the world, beat us, like make something funnier. Right? But this is a Vegas act that's fairly famous. So it turns out if you just like pay people money, they'll do it for you. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Ethan's house, but it's uh, uh, a bunch of weird stuff is going to happen in this film. And, and then we'll provide the assets probably, and um, you make a funnier film out of it. But th this is mostly to test, like be able to ingest and do the whole process uh, by ourselves. But, but um, We'll have fun with it, and we'll do more and more of these things. Okay, so um, this, this is the blurb. Uh, jobs at Array.com, or just go to Array. It's Array with an AI, so Array AI, why? You know, it was late, and we had to get filed in the morning, so. That's <laughs> what <laughs> uh, you get for shots of whiskey, but, <laughs> um, you know, it, uh, we're going with it. Um, Yeah, if you're asking, I have a question.
question, please let the mic come to you okay. so that our viewers have the at home mic hear the question comes in. Yeah, good. The answer. I think I saw this hand shoot up first. Yes, yeah, so any order. Check. Check. It, uh, I hear you. You can hear me. Uh, amazing presentation. Um, can you talk more, or if you can, about advising Magic Leap and just more thoughts about <laughs> AR and VR? <laughs> uh, what you can publicly <laughs> say and share? Um, my lawyer can talk about <laughs> No, I, I, I can't. I, I, well, I can't talk about Magic Leap. I wish them well. Um, <laughs> you know, if they can make a headset or someone can make a headset, we're making content for that. My personal belief about the AR industry is it's just going to take longer than people think because of the headsets. And particular women, like what are they going to wear on their nose that doesn't look, I won't even wear crazy stuff. But I, I kind of like uh, the simple things Intel is doing. Like I wear glasses anyhow because I don't like them, but they give me so much benefit I deal with them. So if someone could give me more benefit by just giving me, like, I don't know, little map indicators when I'm bike riding, I'll, I'll do that. But I, I just think the form factor, um, you know, if there are Oculus people, I go, why does it have to look like a brick? Scratch <laughs> your face. Can't you steampunk it, make it look cool? You know, don't you have enough billions to do that? But anyhow, um, um, so, I don't, you know, we're, we're agnostic to whether, when the industry starts. We are, are, some of our advisors are from Serbios, which is the top VR game company. And we're happy whenever that industry happens. And, and we're talking with them and, and all our stuff is future proofing. We're dimensionalizing the scenes. And again, we talk with directors and things and they don't necessarily want, they want to tell a story. So they want like 180, not 360. And, and so you find out things from like the the master storytellers of like what they want. They want, they want like the feeling of like people are making all these rigs. They don't want actually 360. It's hard to like tell a narrative, um, but they want a feeling of a little bit of agency, like parallax, a little bit, and and then a direction of uh, like you can turn this way or that way, and and some sort of focus. But you know, no one really knows the answer right now of how to make a. VR film, we just know we're capturing a dimensionalized image and you could take those assets later and turn them into, you know, cheaply turn them into 3D and re-render them in, uh, you know, Unreal or, or whatever. Next question. I lost the name, but he's in the visual effects industry for 40 years and, and, and apparently I failed because he doesn't know what our company's trying to do. Um, <laughs> we're trying to survive. Like, you know, um, survive and thrive. Um, <laughs> you know, what we want to do is, is automate, like the hope is 10x, uh, 10x less effort, uh, the process of making visual effects. So all those assets, for instance, rotoscoping, we'd like that to be 10x more efficient, and that we think like there's these big bottlenecks hitting the film industry. We also think a lot of creativity is bottled up because you do things a certain way when it's a pain to do them. Like a lot of filming avoids special effects by just by just uh, you know arranging to have the film different. Also, what is sent to a special effects house? Now sometimes it's different and independent and a professional, but a lot of times they spend a lot of time thinking what they're going to send. What our model is, the hope is, you will sit, you'll film with our things, you will have, let's say, first product, the camera, the focus parameters, the exact tracks, that'll, be, that'll go out that, uh, real time. Um, you'll, get a, you'll get a proxy of what the thing's going to look in real time, but the next morning you will get uh, the rotoscoped assets of everything. Right, you'd probably specify, I want the people or I want the car and this and that, and you'll get those in the next morning. And, and this will all be for a fixed fee, right? So you'll know, you don't have to worry about what you're gonna do. That whole, the, the, those assets that go in the VFX will go out with the film instead of having a delay. And we think this will change a lot of things in creativity. 
our aims are much broader. We want to relight the scene. We want to like understand surface lightings and be able to change anything and, and make generative scenes. So you capture a scene once and other people can license and regenerate it. And what we want, and, and from there, like ultimately what we want is, we want you to like, this, like talk about a movie and largely visualize it. And this could be done by deep nets, mapping to, oh, you have a restaurant scene. Well, we have five, blend them, and there is a scene. It's not the movie, but it's kind of a storyboard of it, and then you refine it. And there's a lot of, like, Wattpad, like, you know, narratives that have 100 million readers. That could be video. Um, so we want to just make this process uh, easier and easier and spread it into many related films. We have sports people approaching us. We can't do it, we just don't have the bandwidth, but that's uh, sometimes, a lot of game industry, you know, wanting to collect more real assets, so, okay, that's kind of like that music video, and there's a music video industry, we talk with a lot of people, they want to do cooler things, and, and, you know, but it's expensive and it's slow, and they want to, a, a lot of times what's wrong with movies is like, there's a market risk, they take so long, that you kind of miss the market for it, and like we want to eliminate that problem. So I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> uh, we can talk after. Uh, uh, yeah. well, okay. Let's take two more questions. Yeah. On the do, do uh, visual storytellers have to learn how to use your tools, or do you have a path where you're trying to maybe use uh, existing pipelines and true plugins integrate? So right now, I'm repeating the question. Okay. So the question is: Are we making our own tools? Uh, do you have to learn them, or can you plug into existing tools? Right now, we don't even have a product. So, but 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 the idea is that we'll take these assets and you can plug them into. We're already doing this with with Nuke and Silhouette that you can plug this in and refine them or After Effects and refine them. Now, on some things in post-production, because of the way it's done, it's rather clumsy. And so we want to have our own tools just to make some processes faster. Like the way uh, people do splines is for a, you know, a hand-done era, whereas this is machine done. And so we think we, we're going to make some tool that, that gets rid of some of the inefficiencies, we think, in the interface that, that people have. It's very important to maintain your splines because that saves your time. But I go, if the, if the outlines are free, it's not important to maintain your splines. It's, it's, it's important to be able to interact with the boundaries quickly. So, um, you know, there are some things that will change because we have to mostly, for our first product, um, we're going to plug into existing tools. One more? Gary? I have uh, a <laughs> hand. Uh, I have a hand. <laughs> He's been raising his hand for a while. <laughs> Someone. I can take your camera and your phone and give it back to you. Uh, sure. That's better. Oh, this really works. I'm uh, KRS Murthy. I ran a video game company and uh, 3D animation companies. I understand some of it, but I think that you know. Uh, there's a remix in, in music. I'm now taking that stretch into an analogy into this kind of an industry where different uh, motions are captured, different perspectives are captured, as long as there's no blind spot issue. In yeah. multiple cameras, there's a distance where there's a blind spot, right? Uh, is that potential with what you're trying to do for multiple people generating the, the amateurs uh, or even professionals and someone else will take it and composite them or actually remix them. Uh, yes, oh, um, the answer is I don't know, but uh, what we expect is if this process gets easier that we're going to be surprised with people doing things we didn't expect, one of which would be remixing. And the problem is you can't remix anything now or it's very difficult because they don't release any of this stuff. It's all held in vaults and under privacy and NDAs. But if 
there's a lot of content and YouTubes and stuff where people aren't being as strict with it. Yeah. Or if, like, ten years after a film, they go, you know what, we're going to release it all, remix it, remake it. Here's all the, the mask and, the, and, and the, the raw data, then I think there would be. This is one of the things we're going to do. We're going to do some of these short films. And then we're going to release all the assets, the masks, the yeah. motion tracks, everything, and say, do another film, make another film out of it, and see what people come up with. So I think that's an aspect of this. I would expect things like this, and I would expect the unexpected. <laughs> you know, that, and one of the things is trying to boost creativity. For instance, we're not getting rid of VFX artists. There's always going to be human in the loop because the consumer is a human. And people do non-human, non-realistic things for dramatic effects. So there's always going to be artists in the loop. But the artist isn't going to spend time tracking the size of cars or easy stuff. They're going to be doing the dramatic effects rather than the, the tedious stuff. That's that's what we think in the future. All right. Let's all let's all give Dr. Gretchen.